Hello and welcome to St. Matthew Lutheran Church of Milwaukee. This is the service for the second Sunday in Lent, February 25th, 2024. We begin with, Lord, you I love with all my heart. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. 
I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The works of the Lord are great and glorious. His name is worthy of praise. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you see that we have no power to defend ourselves. Guard and keep us both outwardly and inwardly from all adversities that may happen to the body and all evil thoughts that may assault and hurt the soul. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first scripture reading is from the book of Job, chapter 1, beginning at verse 13. One day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby and the Sabaeans attacked and made off with them. They put the servants to the sword and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The fire of God fell from the heavens and burned up the sheep and the servants, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The Chaldeans formed three raiding parties and swept down on your camels and made off with them. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, yet another messenger came and said, Your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on them, and they are dead, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. 
At this, Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground in worship and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We sing Psalm 22, which is the text for our sermon, which has the theme, Embrace These Extremes. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? I am a worm and not a man. Who see me, mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say, let the Lord rescue him. is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. A pack of villains encircles me. Divide my clothes among them. They cast lots for my garments. Behold, behold me, O the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin. But you, Lord, do not be far from me. You are my strength, come quickly to help me. I will declare your name to my people. of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations will bow down before him. 
they will proclaim his righteousness. Declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now. The second reading is from the Apostle Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 5, the first 11 verses. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We acclaim the gospel. Praise to Gospel is recorded by St. Mark in chapter 8, beginning at verse 31. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed, and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. 
But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. We confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We sing of how deep the Father's love is for us. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss. The father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory. May the God of all peace give you joy in believing in the one whose punishment brought us peace, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear fellow redeemed in Christ Jesus, it's easy to see why we are often told to avoid extremes. Oftentimes we even do that naturally. Does anyone really want to live all the time in the extreme cold of the Arctic? 
Or does anyone want to live all the time in the extreme heat of the desert? Or think of seasoning our food. Very few of us want to have food with no sort of seasoning or salt on it whatsoever. And very few of us want to go to the other extreme and have some of those medically dangerous spices on them. You know, even the book of Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes in Scripture says this, whoever fears God will avoid all extremes. And yet, there is a time for not avoiding extremes. In fact, there's a time to embrace them. And Psalm 22 is one of those times as it describes a number of extreme things. We are to embrace these extremes, examining them and echoing them. Here is a wonderful way this psalm is on the extreme end of things. If we lined up all the psalms in the order, not their numbers, but which ones are quoted in the New Testament, Psalm 22 is on the extreme end, more quoted than any other psalm in the Bible. Also extreme in this psalm is the number of specific prophecies fulfilled on Good Friday. They quickly get into the double digits written about a thousand years before the cross on Calvary. This psalm specifically speaks of exactly what went on that day. And the first verse of the psalm gets right to the heart of both those things. It's quoted in the New Testament. More than that, it's quoted by the Savior himself on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus spoke those words to express the extreme, the extraordinary situation of his being separated from his Father. We confess that the Son is eternally begotten of the Father. The Father was always with him, and the Son was always with the Father, except in this extreme situation of the cross, where Jesus himself becomes sin. God tells us sin separates us from God. So when the Son of God, though sinless himself, takes on the sins of the world, he is separated for the first time since from eternity from his Father. And he's separated and endures that extreme anguish so that we sinners whose own sin had separated us from God might be joined with the Father forever so that we might have union with him so that we might receive the full rights of sons. We're not God's stepchildren. We're not simply trusted servants. We are his children. And yet, what does the sinless one call himself in prophecy? The one who created all, the one who is Lord of all, he says, I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. He becomes the lowest and the most despicable, like a mere worm, so that we can be the highest. We can be sons and daughters of the king, so that we can be ruling with the Lord forever. The Lord of all becomes as a worm so that we, the true worms, the sinners, might rule over all things with him. This is why we say embrace 
these extremes, this description of what our Lord did for us. When we examine something like capital punishment, which is what took place on the cross, the putting to death of someone by the government, we think of how we hear about capital punishment in our news in our country from time to time because some states, not our state, but some states still have capital punishment. And a lot of the debate centers on seeking to put a criminal to death in a humane way. And the discussion always gets back to one of the amendments to our United States Constitution that forbids cruel and unusual punishment. When you consider that phrase and you examine our Lord's crucifixion, you realize that there was no protection like that in the Roman government's system of laws. You realize that death on a cross was intended to be cruel. It was cruel by design. When we pause and consider that, we realize the suffering and especially the humiliation of the cross. Again, that the Lord of all is subjected to cruel and unusual punishment. When we examine his words in the New Testament, they come out of our Lord's mouth on the cross as I thirst. In the Psalm, Jesus says, my mouth is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. How extreme that the one who created the world, which includes water, which includes so much fresh water, just consider our nearby Great Lakes. The Lord who made all of that doesn't even have a drop of it to soothe his thirst on the cross on Good Friday. This is extreme. This is absurd. And yet he suffers for us, and we hear his words, I thirst. We hear the extreme verbal abuse that he goes through. This psalm just has the Savior saying, All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. And later this psalm says, our Savior says, People gloat over me. So people use their words and the gift of speech that God gave them to communicate, and they use it to ridicule the one who gave them those gifts. And the Lord, in his extraordinary, extreme mercy, forgives that. And the Lord says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And the Lord himself reverses the situation. And we have the good news in this psalm, I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly, I will praise you. So the Lord, against whom the human words were used to mock, he uses words to communicate his love and expound to them the glories and mercies of the Lord. Some of these verses in the psalm are so easy to spot. When Jesus says exactly what's in the psalm, we know he's quoting it. That phrase I just read isn't as easy to realize is fulfilled in the New Testament, except in the second chapter of Hebrews, that verse is quoted, and it is said that the fulfillment of it is that Jesus is not ashamed to be called our brother. This verse is used to communicate that the Savior has removed our sins and calls us, like him, the sinless ones. He says, 
You are my sister. You are my brother for time and for eternity. This psalm perhaps doesn't address the specific instance of darkness on Good Friday. The, the three hours from noon till three when darkness covered the whole earth. What an extreme that was. That has, hasn't happened before. That hasn't happened since. But this extreme darkness leads to the good news of us living in the light of endless day, where the book of Revelation describes there's no lamps needed, there's no fire needed, because the Lord himself is the light of heaven. This psalm describes the Lord himself being treated as an enemy of his father, as an enemy of the people, and he allows that extreme situation so that he can call us his friends, and we can call him our friend. He goes through the extreme situation of being abandoned by his disciples, by his brothers, by his father, so that we can hold on to the promise that he will never abandon us. This psalm also addresses one of the extreme reversals that God in his grace brings about. Sinners strip Jesus naked, and he gives us his robes of righteousness. He was treated in the most humiliating way possible so that we can be dressed in the most glorious way possible. We're given his perfection. Any of these many prophecies of the extreme things which went on on Good Friday give us reason to reflect and rejoice. And they give us reasons to echo them. Yes, the sacrifice of Jesus was an extreme event with wonderful and extreme results. But it's not as though Jesus' life and ministry did not foreshadow extreme things. In what he said and did, he was extreme. What was he called to task for a number of times? Jesus welcomes sinners and eats with them. Different people that a lot of other people would look down on and avoid withdraw from, probably advise their children not to be anywhere near. Jesus went to them and welcomed them and ate with them. Our lives are to echo that. We are not supposed to just be kind to and look for and try to help people that are just like us with the same background and so on. We're to look for those whom society may have rejected. And we are to be the friend of sinners that Jesus was. We as sinners ourselves have such a great reason to do that. When we think of Jesus' commands about going out into all the world and preaching the gospel to every creature, we could describe those commands as kind of extreme. He doesn't speak in halfway measures or suggest a limited effort. He says, go into all the world. You may have heard or read that we can be thankful that our church body in its world missions has recently begun a special effort to look specifically for areas in the world where we are not aware that anyone is bringing God's word to those people. That's a way of echoing Jesus' command in our work. Go where the word is not and bring this saving word to the people. 
This psalm is all about the crucifixion of our Savior, and we are to be echoing that crucifixion in our daily lives. We are told to crucify our sinful nature with all its deeds and desires. We aren't to feed it with what it's eager to have and do. We aren't to be sampling the things that look enticing and enjoyable to us. We are to be starving it of its desires for the various wrong things that our sinful nature wants. We are to echo our Lord's crucifixion daily by putting to death our own sinful flesh. And we are to follow our Lord and echo him in his obedience. Because the Father willed it and commanded him, he went to the cross. He totally dedicated himself. He didn't hold back in any way. And we are told that our lives are to be living sacrifices to our Lord. They are to involve total obedience. I recently read one of those statements that really should have been obvious to me before, but perhaps just the way it was put made me stop and think. It said that if in our lives as followers, as disciples, as believers in our Savior, we decide that there is a certain command that we're just not going to obey. All the other things we're, we're going along with, but this is the area where I'm not going to obey him. That's not obedience, is it? Again, it should, should be obvious, but I think it points to a trick that we play on ourselves when we think, well, I do this, and I do this, and this, but now this thing that would be so hard or so inconvenient for me to do, this I can't do. And that does not match up with what we heard our Savior say about losing our life for his sake and gaining eternal life. Which reminds us that we are to also be echoing his resurrection. God assures us that we were buried with our Savior in our baptism into death with this purpose. Just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. It was a glorious thing when our Savior rose on Easter morning, showing himself entirely alive, ready to return to heaven. Our lives are to echo that resurrection. He did these things so that we can live a new life on this earth and look ahead eagerly to our glorious life in heaven. We mentioned that the very first verse of this psalm is so easily identified as something our Savior said on the cross. The very last verse of this psalm takes us right to our Savior's words as well. The last part of this psalm speaks of God's people proclaiming his righteousness and declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. And we recognize that that sounds an awful lot like Jesus announcing it is finished. It is done. And what is done was his demonstration of his extreme an eternal love for each of us and for a world of sinners. And what that tells us is we are to be extremely eager to praise him and live for him as well. Amen. The peace of God which goes beyond our understanding will keep our hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.
Eternal Lord, give us peace as we ponder the good news that you forgive our sins in Christ. Lead us to see clearly the path you have laid out for us. Work in us so that we believe and live the word we have heard today. Provide courage and compassion to all who preach and teach your word. Fill them with a love like yours as they proclaim your grace to us and all people. Move us to love all ministers of the word wherever they serve. Guard and guide the families of our congregation Lead husbands and wives to love each other with commitment, respect, and patience. Help parents to grasp the eternal value of keeping their children close to Jesus all their lives. Grant joy to those who are single and make them a blessing to others. Protect us from the temptations that surround us. Give us pure hearts and minds. Provide wisdom and insight to those who make laws and set policies. Give us respect for those who protect us from crime. Lead us to value the rights of our fellow citizens and to defend those who cannot defend themselves. Bless our land with peace and prosperity so that the gospel may be proclaimed to all. Give us passion to share the story of your love with our family and friends. Overcome unbelief and open the hearts of people everywhere to believe the good news that Jesus has forgiven their sins and opened the gates of heaven. Fill us with joy over every sinner who repents and comes to trust in you. Extend your healing power to those who are sick and suffering in body or mind. Give patience and compassion to all who care for the sick and dying. Lift the eyes of the distressed to love, to your love in Christ. Hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. Gracious God, you govern and direct all things, and you love all people. Hear our prayers, spoken and silent, and answer them in your wisdom and grace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. We join in the closing hymn.
What a privilege and joy to hear the words of our Savior and worship him together. We look forward to seeing you sometime in person here at St. Matthew Lutheran Church, 8444 West Melvina in Milwaukee. Sunday services are at 9, Monday night service at 6.30. During Lent on Wednesdays, we have services at 4 and 6.30 on Wednesdays with a supper in between to which you are also, of course, invited. God be with you and yours until we meet again.